Hi there, Mark Finan here in the Home Weather Office. Wanted to talk to you about something we'll be hearing more about as we go through 2025 and beyond. And you maybe have already heard about it, AI weather forecasting, artificial intelligence weather forecasting. Of course, we've been hearing about AI with all sorts of implications and how it's already being used. And there is uh, an application for it in weather. And maybe again, you've heard about that. And it's, from what I understand, going to become more mainstream and more public as we go through the first part of 2025. And since I'm putting this on YouTube, it's going to be interesting to see how this video ages. Anyway, let me talk a little bit more about what I've been learning so far about it, maybe bring you up to speed so maybe you can understand a little bit more about what it is and what we can expect. So this is uh, an article that came out, and this is from Google. It's uh, the Google DeepMind project, and what this says is GenCast. That's what this thing is called, is GenCast. The headline here is GenCast predicts weather and risks of extreme conditions with state-of-the-art accuracy. It's really an interesting idea, and I'm hoping this does work and maybe does help us improve weather forecasting down the road. But I want to explain the difference between the, the way that artificial intelligence weather forecasting is going to work versus the weather forecasting that we've been doing for, well, for all the time that I've been weather forecasting, more than 40 years. And uh, it goes back even farther than that, what we call numerical weather prediction. So let me show you what we currently use in the maps that we show you all the time. So this, for example, is a 500 millibar chart across the United States. And this is from the GFS. And this is actually has a, a global version as well. There's the Euro version of this. There's the, the NAM, the North American model. There's the HRRR model, the high resolution model that I often show you here as well. A very high resolution, but generally regional model it does very, very well with high resolution. So what the how these models are made is you take the current conditions. So let's say right now you go just across the United States, let's say, and you have take a snapshot of what's happening right now. The temperature at the surface, the humidity, the, the wind, the atmospheric pressure, uh, you do that at the surface and then you go all the way through the atmosphere, you slice the atmosphere and you take all of those current conditions and you do a snapshot. So that's your, your initialization. After you take your initialization, you plug that into what are called the equations of the atmosphere, basically. And then the model runs that and says, OK, if, it's, if you have a certain uh, condition at this point, what's going to happen one hour, three hours, 12 hours to that condition based on how the atmosphere works? And to give you an idea of just how complex this is, I'll tell you, um, this is stuff that that my my brain um, <laughs> uh, I, I have forgotten all of this stuff from when I was in college, and man, it's just uh, yeah. So the equations of the atmosphere. So it's it's equations that look like this. So you take current conditions, and then you you see all these T's in here. So this is by time, by time, conservation of mass, and then you have conservation of momentum. All of these are current conditions, and then basically in the Coriolis effect and angular momentum and all this kind of stuff, hydrostatic balance. <sighs> yeah, it, it, believe me, there was a time when, when I did have to learn all this stuff and meteorologists had to learn this kind of stuff in courses known as dynamics. Uh, but it's, it's important to know this as the, what, how the atmosphere works, but this is what the uh, the equations of the atmosphere are that are plugged into the models that we show you. Of course, we don't do these <laughs> by hand, and I haven't looked at these in ages, but this these are what's called the equations of the atmosphere, and all of these would be uh, various parameters of the atmosphere that would be plugged into how they change with time based on things like the Coriolis effect and angular momentum and all of the rest of that and how moisture works and yeah the primitive equations yeah they called that the primitive equations <laughs> and uh, I laughed at that when I was in college yeah these are primitive right so anyway so these are the equations of the atmosphere or just a few of them and as you plug those into the current conditions then you come out with this sort of thing so that's how numerical weather prediction as we have known it for a long time works 
and it's gotten much, much better over time, especially because the power of computing has gotten so much better. You can just imagine the amount of data that goes into making up a weather forecast, and then you plug it into those complex equations, just what it would take for a computer to spit all of that out. And now that we have models like the HRRR that have the high resolution, they only go out sometimes 15 hours, sometimes out to 24, uh, 48 hours rather, but it's because there is so much data packed into a high resolution model that again, it's maxing out the computers, but it's something that we wouldn't have been able to do 10, 20 years ago because the computing power just wasn't there. So that's how that the forecasting that we have been doing works. Let me show you the difference with the what's going to be AI learning. Now there was an article in, let me see, where is it here? Yeah, here it is. So there's an article in uh, in Nature that um, has a lot about this, and I'll post it, I'll post it. So if you really want to dig into this, you can you can read this uh, for yourself. So here it is. It's probabilistic weather forecasting with machine learning, and it talks about everything that they have done here. And what they have done is they used the 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 European model, but not the European model for forecasting, but for its initialization. And what they did was they took all of the data from, let's see, I wrote this down, it's 1979 to 2018, so 40 years of data. And what they did was they ran 40 years of data through uh, the machine, if you want to call it that, um, and to have the machine pick out trends and that sort of thing. And now what they do is they make a global 15-day ensemble forecast at quarter degree resolution, and it says it's more accurate than top operation on ensemble of the European model. And uh, the other interesting thing about this is this can generate a forecast in eight minutes. Eight minutes is amazing, considering that the that this model takes hours to generate. And now what they're talking about is this model can be run in eight minutes. But it's it's not really being based on on the equations of the atmosphere. Instead, it's based on what the what has happened in the atmosphere for the last 40 years. Now, if I skip down here, they use some examples in here, but down in here, they do have, I found this to be rather interesting. Um, as, I, as I said, I'll post this so you can look at this yourself. So this is the 15 days, if you will. This is temperature. And so, uh, and this is the surface up to uh, aloft. And so what it's showing you here is that these darker blue boxes, this is the improvement over the, uh, the numerical model, vast improvement in the short term that decreases over time so that by the time you get out to 15 days, there's very little improvement. And the same thing with, um, with specific humidity and all the other parameters that it does decrease in time. The accuracy decreases in time as you as you might expect but as you can see in the shorter range there is a vast improvement over what the uh what the current models do so what does this mean is this going to replace numerical weather prediction as we have known it probably not and certainly not right away it looks as though this is going to be used maybe more in conjunction another tool so to speak so as this becomes more available as i and other meteorologists go about making a daily forecast, we'll look at the traditional numerical weather prediction models and then probably look at an AI model. So what we may do is just kind of, so in the morning, I'll look at the GFS, the NAM, the HRRR, the Euro, and maybe I'll look at the AI model as well. What they say also is that this is better at predicting extreme events. Now, the thing that I'm going to find to see if it does better or to see if there is a, uh, an increase in efficiency here, is maybe they can get this to be a higher resolution model. I, I showed you that it's a quarter degree resolution. Right now, that's not great resolution. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they make this more regional, and I'm sure they will. For instance, what I'd like to see is if they make this on a regional basis, so let's use a Northern California uh, example if they used it on a regional basis so that we could find uh, rainfall or potential rainfall in some of our river basins uh, and get it down to that sort of resolution, 
um, so that we could tell maybe five to seven days out whether or not there was going to be a lot of rain on the Cosumnes, let's say, or the Feather River Basin or into the American River Basin that would be an extreme event and know that with a greater lead time, that would be amazing. From what I've seen so far, it doesn't quite have that resolution. But as I said, this is still relatively early in the game. And as I'm recording this here in early 2025, uh, we'll see how well this ages. I think this is going to be a vast improvement for weather forecasting in general, uh, but it will be interesting to see how it's made more regional and how it's used daily by, by meteorologists. As I said, at least right now, I don't see it replacing traditional forecasting, but it will be another tool that will hopefully make forecasting even better than it is right now. So I hope you found that helpful. It's just kind of an overview, a lot of generalizations in there about how things work right now. But I'll post a link to that, uh, that article from Nature, as well as the, the one on GenCast, so you can get an idea of how this is all uh, going to work. And so you can read those for yourselves if you want to take a, a deep dive into that. So again, I hope you found that helpful. I'll talk with you later.